All right. Welcome back. We will um, resume with our afternoon session. I would like to introduce our next speaker. Colleen Darland. Colleen is pursuing a Master of Arts in Theology at St. John's University. In addition to her studies, Colleen works for the Diocese of Devonport as their Safe Environment and Logistics Coordinator. She is also the organist at Sacred Heart Cathedral, Devonport, Iowa. Colleen received a Bachelor of Arts degree magna cum, uh, with, uh, with magna cum laude in church music from Wartburg College, Waverly, Iowa. In, two, in 2019, she wrote a series of articles for the Diocese of Devonport's Liturgy Office newsletter on music in the different seasons of the liturgical year. Please join me in welcoming Colleen. Good afternoon, everyone. Can you hear me all right? Good, thumbs up? Thank you. Um, so my topic today is a historical survey of the development of marriage rituals in the United States, more particularly um, uh, an exploration of the place of pastoral rituals as part of the, the larger ritual of the order of celebrating matrimony. So there are many cultural rituals that take place as, as part of getting married, family traditions, religious rites, and any number of symbolic actions are often points of contention between the two parties approaching marriage. These symbols can carry rich meaning for the individual families, and in some cases can be an opportunity for creating new rituals as a new family unit is established. Some rituals bear a long history and evolution through various centuries and cultural contexts, while others are more recent developments still seeking ritual meaning. Here we will survey the evolution of key ritual symbols in the rite of marriage, including the giving of aras and the use of the lasso or veil, uh, as well as a survey of the unity candle, which has not yet been given status in the Catholic order for celebrating matrimony hereafter. I'll just say OCM, it's faster. <laughs> These symbols will be compared in their history, cultural context, meaning, and the weight given to each symbol as part of the rite. The blessing and giving of aras and the blessing and placing of the lasso or veil are both optional rituals to be added to the marriage rite when pastoral need requires. These traditions are best known to be most popular for Mexican and Filipino families in the United States, as these traditions hold great meaning um, consulting their respective cultural heritages. These rituals have been included in the Spanish translation of the OCM in the United States since 2010, and with the most re recent revision of the English translation are now included as an optional right here in the English. The placement of the, in the second edition of the OCM was actually determined by the Congregation for Divine Worship and the Discipline of the Sacraments out of Rome, and its inclusion as an optional right is different from what the original uh, in the original proposition by the U.S. bishops. Uh, USCCB had approved its inclusion in an appendix of the second edition, uh, but Rome approved it to be included within the rite itself. Speculation could be made as to the reasoning for this placement, but it's likely that Rome altered the proposed location in order to align the English translation with the previous Spanish translation in 2010, which includes the rites for the aras and the lasso or veil within the OCM itself, not in an appendix. The aras especially bears a long history in the church and has evolved throughout centuries and cultures to manifest in a variety of ways. One of the earliest references to the Aras, which translates as pledge, comes in the fourth century by such writers as St. John Chrysostom from the Eastern tradition. The original symbol of this pledge was likely a ring, as the Byzantine tradition includes a ring being given and accompanied by a prayer recalling the betrothal of Isaac and Rebekah. The tradition, tradition developed in the West seems to be delayed by several centuries, resurrecting in 11th century Spain. The imagery of Isaac and Rebecca is present here again in this Christian context during the Muslim, Muslim occupation of Spain. The symbolism of the exchange of rings or a few coins has evolved 
up to this point. In the Liber Ordinum, a hymnal from uh, the Muslim occupation, they are part of a preparatory rite, often during Vespers preceding the nuptial mass, the day before, not the day itself. The Aras, sometimes spelled instead of A-R-R-A-H, spelled A-S, I'm sorry, sometimes are spelled A-R-R-H-A-S, were originally part of a betrothal ceremony where the bride price was paid to the woman's family. Though later, this took on a more Germanic influence as a settlement on the bride by the groom in case of early widowhood. The prayer that traditionally accompanies this rite now speaks of the pledge being given as the plural, which may suggest that the symbol has expanded um, here in the 14th century beyond a single ring, like what is used to the East, to an exchange of rings or of some other token here in the Western tradition. It's not until the 14th century that the now traditional 13 coins are referenced as being part of the Aras exchanged. In the second edition of the OCM, the blessing and giving of Aras is included during the celebration of matrimony immediately following the exchange of rings. In the English translation, the words used during the blessing and giving of Aras echoes what was just previously said during the exchange of rings, which creates a continuity between these two smaller rituals, even though the Aras are optional. They both follow the pattern of invoking God's blessing, expressing that the tokens are to be gifted to each other, and finally, as either a sign or a promise of blessing. After the presider speaks the blessing, the husband takes the aras and pours them into his wife's hands while saying, quote, receive these aras as a pledge of God's blessing and a sign of the good gifts we will share, end quote. The wife repeats these words as she pours the tokens back into her husband's hands. After this, there's an option for a hymn or canticle of praise before transitioning to the universal prayer. In most families who celebrate the Aras, padrinos or sponsors present the Aras for blessing in exchange by the couple. This support from beyond the immediate family shows the interconnectedness of the community as part of this ritual. There's an interesting commentary on the development of the prayers and symbols that accompany Aras through the centuries. In the Eastern tradition, especially the Syrian Oriental Orthodox rite, the symbol of the ring continues in its historical context as a sign of betrothal, and eventually there develops a mutual exchange of rings during the marriage rite, rather than a one-sided gift on the part of the groom. However, in the West, rings and coins developed more quickly as connected symbols. The prayer in the Liber Ordinum from Spain echoes the Eastern prayer modeled after Isaac's betrothal to Rebecca, quoted here, Lord, all-powerful God, you commanded Abraham to give Isaac to Rebekah through the exchange of Aras as an image of holy matrimony, so that by the offering of rings, the number of children might be increased. We pray you to sanctify with your power this offering of Aras, which your servant, husband, makes to his beloved bride. Graciously bless both them and their gifts, so that, protected by your blessing and joined in the bond of love, they may rejoice to be counted among your faithful forever, end quote. But here we see the one-sided gift from the groom is still the norm. Later in 15th century England, coins become an integral part of the ritual gifting of the ring. This symbol of not just one coin, but multiple is a sign not only of prosperity and hope of blessing for the couple, but it's a unique symbol in that the behavior of the coins is changed. One coin alone is silent, yet where several are born, you know, jingling in your pocket, they are now noisy, showing how the lives of the couple are changed through their union together. <clears throat> the number of coins as part of the Aras have varied, but especially in the Hispanic tradition, 12 or 13 coins are given. 13 coins are preferred as the baker's dozen symbolizes prosperity and shows that the husband can support his new wife and future family. A cultural change has developed between traditions in Mexico and those brought to the United States by migrants. Where the OCM for the United States has the wife pour the aras back into her husband's hands, in Mexico, this is not done. Here in the United States, it seems a deeper mutuality has been infused into the marriage rituals, acknowledging that it is not solely the responsibility of the husband to provide for the family. There is also some discussion of connecting the blessings and prosperity hoped for by the exchange of aras with the element of service inherent in the sacrament of marriage. 
In the final blessing of the OCM, there is a direct petition that the couple, quote, be witnesses in the world to God's charity, so that the afflicted and needy who have known your kindness may one day receive you thankfully into the eternal dwelling of God, end quote. Exploring the potential shift in focus from simply asking blessings for the couple to the couple sharing their blessings with the wider community draws the couple from their focus on just each other to being an example of God's love to those around them. Now the lasso or veil is a separate ritual that has a very similar history to the Aras, but not as much evolution. In the Middle Ages, a large veil or canopy would be placed over the couple to show how they both are covered by God's blessing. In Visigothic rites, instead of a veil, a special cord is placed around the couple to symbolize their unity as they receive the nuptial blessing. Since then, this symbol has changed little, maintaining its design as a single cord, often in a figure eight design to emulate the infinity symbol. In 15th century Britain, however, the veil was the preferred element held over the couple as they received the nuptial blessing. A deep connection between the lasso or veil seems to have been closely tied with the nuptial blessing throughout, but the implementation of the ritual varies. Depending on local custom, much is left to the discretion of the presider working with particular families. In some contexts, the symbol may be the bride's veil being pinned across the groom's shoulder so that they are both under its cover for the blessing. For others, the separate figure eight cord, sometimes in the form of a double rosary, may be placed by padrinos over the couple. The timing of this placement also varies. In the United States, the norm is to wear the symbol only during the nuptial blessing, which is given between the Our Father and the sign of peace during the mass. But in Mexico, the lasso or veil may be placed as soon as the couple kneels after the sanctus and remains in place through that nuptial blessing until the exchange of peace, mostly to allow for freer movement during the exchange of peace. Within the OCM, the symbol is meant to show the bond that unites the couple as they receive the nuptial blessing together, but there is no concrete instruction for the preferred time to place it. Some find additional meaning, especially in the lasso, that the burdens of marriage are shared equally between both the husband and wife, as well as its blessings. The aras and lasso, or veil, have a rich history in the church, closely tied with petitioning God's blessings on the newlywed couple through symbolic coins or rings and demonstrating their oneness as they receive these blessings. The unity candle has a much shorter history, finding its origin from the commercial wedding industry in the United States in the late 20th century. This secular origin, possibly borrowing from longstanding use of candles in the liturgy, causes no end of discussion regarding its suitability in the Catholic liturgy. The ritual is simple enough, spread through two main parts of the liturgy. The unity candle, consisting of one larger candle flanked by two smaller tapers, is set up on a small table, table separate from the altar. During the entrance procession, the mothers of the couple or other representatives from each family approach and light their respective side taper. Later in the liturgy, usually after the exchange of rings or after the universal prayer, the couple approaches the table and each taking the taper representing their family of origin, together they light the center candle. At this point, there is some divergence in the ritual depending on the meaning the participants seek to convey, if indeed they give any thought to it at all. The first option is to extinguish the side tapers, symbolizing the new unified household created by the new husband and wife. The second option, more popular perhaps, is to return the lit tapers to their place, maintaining the individual identity of each party in the marriage. In this, the center candle shows their unity, while the tapers represent their individuality and the maintenance of their family connections. Many Christian denominations have accepted the unity candle and other rituals into the wedding ceremony and endeavored to bestow some sacred meaning to it. During the ritual outlined above, some and sometimes an excerpt from scripture is read. The presider offers a prayer on the couple's behalf or a song is sung. Some sample texts offered for this mo movement are revelatory of the symbol derived from something with secular origins. For those who choose to extinguish the side candles, unity is the goal. Quoting here, 
From now on, uh, this is a sample prayer. From now on, their thoughts shall be one for each other rather than for their own individual selves. Their joys and sorrows shall be shared alike. As they light the center one, they will extinguish their own candle, thus letting the center represent the union of their lives into the one flesh. As this one light cannot be divided, neither shall their lives be divided, end quote. This particular language echoes much in the OCM, where the unity of the couple through the help of God is the foundation upon which their relationship and life together is built. This copies the symbolism already seen in the Aras and the Lasso or Veil. There's a different emphasis, though, should the side candles not be extinguished. Here's another example. Uh, quote, bride and groom give of themselves in love, but they do not give their individuality away. For it was that individuality and uniqueness of character that first brought this couple together. A balanced and harmonious relationship is one in which neither person is absorbed by the other. The ultimate strength of marriage, therefore, comes not from their melting into one, but from the forging of two individuals to each other. Allowing the two smaller candles to remain lit, they accept the individuality of each other as a means to the fulfillment of their oneness together." End quote. This individualistic language speaks volumes of the cultural context of this symbol. What began as a commercial endeavor to encourage couples to rent or purchase one more item from a wedding vendor has now become a sign of both unity and individuality, which is deeply ingrained in the culture of the United States. By keeping all three candles burning, the symbol that is demonstrated may become confused or conflated with too many meanings. From a rubrical perspective, the unity candle is not forbidden in the Catholic context. Its inclusion would fall under paragraph 29 of the introduction to the OCM, which allows for, quote, local customs, which may be observed if appropriate, end quote. So it often falls to local tradition, the local ordinary, to determine the suitability of including that right. The unity candle is often placed after the exchange of rings, similar to where the aras are exchanged, where paragraph 68 of the OCM encourages congregational singing. There is often a disconnect between ritual and practice, as the lighting of the unity candle is most often accompanied by a soloist. While a soloist is not expressly forbidden, the rubrics clearly encourage congregational participation. There seems to be a desire to ground these ritual symbols within the context of the wider community to show that the couple does not exist in a vacuum, but are part of the people of God. The unity candle does not seem to have a firm place within the Catholic marriage rite. With so much subjectivity in how the symbol is expressed, a coherent meaning for the worshiping community is not readily found. In lieu of a liturgical context, an alternative place for the unity candle at the wedding reception has met with some pastoral success. Prepared by the Archdiocese of Newark, there exists a use for the unity candle as part of the table prayer for the reception. The idea here is that a prayerful tone is established at the reception, continuing the foundation of faith that the couple began by reciting their vows in a church setting, and it draws a connection to the more important sacrament that was celebrated if reception guests could not attend the ceremony. By being separated from the depth of liturgical symbolism already in the OCM, the unity candle used at the reception does not overshadow the primary symbols of vows and rings exchanged, but still draws a faith connection throughout the day's celebrations. In a pastoral sense, the church is approaching a time when acceptance or alternative use of the unity candle will be necessary. Given that the unity candle was first popularized in the 1990s, couples who partook in the practice then are now having children approaching marriageable age and desiring to pass this symbol down to the next generation. Very often when couples today come to plan their wedding liturgy, they bring up the unity candle because one or both of their families, usually mothers, saved their candle holders to be used by their children. So the question becomes one of whether the church needs to provide a place for the meaning that the individuals and families already hold dear. These three rituals, the aras, the lasso or veil, and the unity candle, each hold deep cultural meaning for the individuals who participate in them. In the traditional sense, the aras and lasso or veil bear the credence of a long history from Jewish roots 
through East and West and cultural contexts and centuries. The Unity Candle is young in its history and stems from a commercial beginning where communities have sought to give meaning to a grassroots initiative. In these rituals, the examination of the meaning of symbols, the symbols convey is key. If the goal of a symbol is to convey an intangible meaning, one must ask what each of these symbols convey. The Aras can be seen as a symbol of the outpouring between husband and wife, not just material providence and divine blessing, but of love between each other and the love shown to the community around them. The lasso or veil covering both husband and wife portrays both unity and humility, showing the indissoluble union they entered into through their vows. The unity candle is seen as an additional sign of unity, but while the continued emphasis on individuality as the meaning of the symbol continues to evolve, a truly accepted meaning is difficult to discern. Many symbols have deep layers of meaning explored through mystagogical reflection, but the meaning should be coherent, building on each other, not contradictory. Symbols and their meaning are integral to religious expression, and those in Christian unity are often the most consistent through centuries of practice. Many pagan or secular symbols from the apostolic era had their meanings changed by the followers of the way, such as the cross taking on the hope of resurrection or the everyday letters Alpha and Omega being used to encompass the vastness of Jesus' divinity. Marriage ritual symbols are no less layered. This exchange of gifts was originally a material reality of human existence, but eventually took on the meaning of gifting oneself to one's spouse. A patriarchal historical treatment has given way to mutual promise and support. Individual symbols are not always of long lasting meaning, but they stand the test of time because their unity, continuity in conveying transcendent meaning. If the goal of ritual development is continuity, guided by the spirit, then this becomes the benchmark of their worthiness for inclusion. The Aras and Lasso have long history with small culture adaptations, but the meaning doesn't change significantly, it only deepens. The unity candle is young and has not solidified any congruous meaning. It can even potentially be conflicting. The individuality aspect of the unity candle is one that um, doesn't necessarily align well with the continuity of tradition. The scripture of, most often quoted in the OCM is the two shall become one flesh, what God has joined together, no human being must separate, quoting the Gospel of Matthew. If this is the ritual metric against which to measure new symbols as they develop, the unity candle's encouragement of individualism, individualism does not truly symbolize the unity God desires for those seeking matrimony. It may be a comfort to the families of origin, but if the couple finds the unity candle to symbolize a way out, then the sacrament is null. With continued discussion and development, liturgical formation and catechesis, the unity candle may someday join the ranks of the Aras and Lasso or Veil as a time-honored cultural symbol, but that time is not yet. The symbol does often precede the meaning given to it, but the meaning must also feed into the symbol in an organic way. To force a meaning onto a symbol before the spirit guides it contradicts the continuity that discernment in the church seeks, but popular piety may feed into the revelatory work of the spirit. The unity candle may find symbolic value in the celebration outside the mass itself, filling a certain level of grief that comes from leaving one's family of origin, but this grief, when one is properly formed, is nothing to the unity and blessing of marriage that is rooted in God's own divine life. Thank you. Thank you, Colleen. We'll spend a few minutes, about five minutes, for questions from the audience. Thank you, Colleen. Very well done. Uh, where, well you. researched. Um, as I was listening, I was thinking about the veil. Would that have its origins in uh, Jewish um, matrimonial uh, liturgies, uh, practice? Because uh, Don't they have something that they do at uh, their marriage ceremony? That's they do. Yeah, they, they have the, the canopy that, that stands over the couple. Um, and that, that is one of the areas that, that they point, the research points to as the origin of the, the lasso or the veil. But it's not just from the Jewish tradition. There are a number, number of cultures who use a similar, similar symbol, the Visigoths as well. 
um, as the traditions moved through through the centuries. And I'm thinking also that in a hundred years, when theologians, liturgists study this, they'll say, "This is a wonderful symbol of the unity candle." Uh, after they've dispensed with the two individual ones remaining lit, and say. Mm -hmm. It had its origins back in 1995. <laughs> <laughs> yep, and you, exactly. And you will be quoted and cited as uh, one of the one of the uh, uh, students or one of the uh, studiers uh, of this. Thank you. Thank, thank you. Any other questions? Hi, Colleen, that was wonderful. Um, Thank you. Uh, oh, this, this may seem like a little bit of a tangent, but I, it since you're so knowledgeable about this, um, any thoughts on what the blessing of same-sex unions is like or is going to be like for people? Is it, you know, just private in a, you know, a, uh, pastor's office. In, any thoughts about that? Oh, nothing like a loaded question. <laughs> um, I I think there are different ways for rituals to develop that fit that fill a pastoral need. Um, as we've had recent direction from from Pope Francis to have to to meet people where they're at and to offer kind of a, a blessing of, of, of intercession for, for that, um, the, the relationship, that friendship that is bound. Um, but there's still a, a clear ritual distinction. Um, you know, the, the language is, is one of blessing, not necessarily ritual at this point. It, it is possible that, that that will develop and rituals continue to develop organically, whether they have the, the status of formal liturgy or not. Um, to to fill that pastoral need, but I think there's a lot of opportunity for discussion and development that that will approach all the relationships that that we share within the human family. So thank you very much, Colin, for an excellent presentation. It's, it's nice to have someone do a hard liturgical stuff with that, that I really love. Uh, and it's nice to be able to respond to that. Your, your paper raises very important points, I think, from in the pastoral setting, uh, because marriage, the, the ministers of the marriage, ultimately is the couple, it's not the priest. You know, the church is there to witness to this sacrament, and marriage was one of the last sacraments to be recognized, uh, 1215, Lateran 4. So we are looking at a very late sacrament and all these uh, traditions that arose. Uh, and it, the, the thing about the, the ministers of the, of the sacraments being the couple, ultimately you see how many traditions have evolved. So what, if you look outside of this uh, exchange of rings, you can see you know, in many uh, contexts, there have always been a, a rich plethora of symbols. So when I'm listening, you know, like if you look at the lasso or the aras, you know, in the St. Thomas Christian tradition, which is uh, and now also part, whether it's both in the Syro Malabar Catholic, Malankara, or even the Jacobites, uh, they have the mantra kodi. The mantra kodi is what a garment, like a veil, that is given by the husband to the bride, symbolizing that his pledge that he will always love her. He will always have her at the center of his life. You know, he will always treat her first. You know, it's some, somewhat similar. And 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 no matter how, whether even though it was even though Rome tried to suppress it, you know, in the in the Sino of Diampo and all those hey, when they were trying to Latinize, but now it's no longer, but it's there. And and so the the, the tali, the two the two most powerful symbols in Syro Malankara Catholic is the mantra kodi, and the tali. The tali is the, is the chain that is also given by the husband to the wife. Now, what are the point I want to raise, whether it's the aras or the lasso or the mantra kodi and the tali on the mino is the fact that these are symbols 
that emerged organically from a community's understandings of symbols. Whereas the, or the point that, that we have to think about for the candle is, is something that is created commercially and marketed. You know, so the dynamics is very different. You're talking about symbols that are there. Uh, and that's why you, you can see the, it, it, there's a, some kind of a universality of symbols. I mean, when you think of Clifford Gears and symbols, you know, the, the, the anthropologist Clifford Gears looking at uh, his construction of symbols and you look at Ricker construction of symbols. One of the things we notice how the idea of cloth in its many forms, whether in Judaism, whether in Hindu, whether in Syro Malaba, whether it's in, you know, uh, uh, in uh, all the, you know, in its many incarnations, uh, and how a very basic primordial symbol, uh, symbols about love, symbol of, of unity, symbol about the fact that, you know, to express the fact that, you know, we are together giving you the cloth. You know, I don't longer not think about myself, I think about you too. You know, whereas in the West, have we ever gotten past our individualism? Because marriage is ultimately is a sacrament of unity. And the, the problem with candles is, candles is one where we have a lot of confusion of meaning because when people think of candle, they think of things like peace, they think of light, they think of overcoming uh, darkness, uh, transformation, but very rarely is candle ever a symbol of love until it's commercially changed. Would that meaning stick? Because, you know, 9-11, uh, we light candles. Now, that's not, you know, it's about peace. You know, uh, in many events, people light candles. Funerals, we light candles. All souls day, we light candles. So candles itself already has a defined meaning. Can corporations change that meaning? So that's the other thing we have to think about. And of course, meanings can and do change. But who is to determine what those meanings are? So I, I have no answers to that. And this is one of the things that, may, that, that could go on. And maybe it may take centuries before it develops. But... Uh, but I'm glad you asked the questions. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much. Let's uh, give Colleen another round of applause. And her cat, too.